All right, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege before we wind up on Psalm 128 and talk to you about a couple of things that that I want to just shepherdishly caution you against. If at the end of what I share, I have sounded unconcerned, you've not heard me. However, I am very, very leery of what I call prophetic alarmism. I had a dear friend kind of breathlessly rush up to me this morning and say to me, what do you think? Prophecies are being fulfilled every day. And I said, well, in the general sense, that's true, but you're obviously flustered. What, what specific prophecy being fulfilled has you upset? Well, it's just everything. And I said, no, no, chapter and verse. Let's go get our Bibles. Show me the chapter in the Word of God that talks about Hamas shelling Jerusalem and the Jews perhaps responding by invading Gaza. Show me that prophecy since you're so flustered about it. Well, the fact of the matter is she was listening to 19 internet bloggers and had herself all worked up such that her agitation was interfering with her faithful living. If your agitation is interfering with your faithful living, you are too agitated. Matthew 24, the greatest prophetic sermon Jesus ever preached. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. So far, he hasn't given any instruction. So far, he's just given information. Listen to the first piece of instruction that he gives. See that you are not alarmed. Are you alarmed? I am not pleased that a, an overt shooting war is happening in the Middle East. I am not pleased at the barbarism that has marked the beginning of that shooting war. It is horrific and it is barbaric and one should not make light of it. I never would. We do pray for the peace of Israel because we are directed to do so. But see that you are not alarmed is not a complex instruction. If you're looking for the instruction in the New Testament or Old that says in light of disturbing events in the Middle East, what you need to be doing is freaking out, you're not going to find that anywhere. 2 Thessalonians 2. And I don't, this is not an entire end times series. I did one of those several years back. It's, I think the audio is still available on our webpage. It was, uh, we don't have video for it. It was done in the fellowship hall with audio only. 2 Thessalonians 2. By the way, the whole theme of 2 Thessalonians, at least a theme of 2 Thessalonians is, yeah, the Lord's going to come back. Until then, get on with holy living. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, the coming of the Lord and the rapture, concerning those events, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. 
Goodness gracious, Paul is echoing Jesus' instruction. Whatever your response is supposed to be, it's not supposed to be alarm. Either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. Listen to this. For that day will not come. What day? The coming of the Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him. He just said it in the previous sentence. That day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Hmm. Puzzles me as an aside. It puzzles me when people say that there are no prophetic things to happen before the Lord returns, that the Lord's return and or the rapture is the next thing when Paul said that day will not come unless something specific comes first. It's like that paragraph doesn't exist. I do not hold to eminence. The view that Jesus could rapture the church at any moment is a view that I do not hold. I don't believe that view is biblically supportable. If you hold that view, again, I did, gosh, 10 hours uh, a few years ago in the fellowship hall and laid out what I believe is a more biblical view. He is coming back and he is going to rapture his church. I don't think that's what's next. But I digress. Whether you would agree with me or whether you would find my position so alien from anything you've ever heard that I've already offended you tonight, you're considering leaving. Um, <laughs> as you leave, my offended friend, <laughs> Jesus said, don't be alarmed. Paul said, don't be alarmed. It might be wise to not be alarmed. Whatever your position is, prophetic alarmism opens the door to the second thing that bugs me. And that is prophetic hucksterism. Where I get you so worked up. The uh, alarmism often is so, in light of the fact that things are so prophetically awful, and the time is so short, and the urgency is so great, what you absolutely must do is send me money. <laughs> Which is bizarre because what? They, they think they're going to have time to spend it? Hmm. In 1988, if I have the year right, it may have been 1987, but I think it was 1988. I was a much younger man on a church staff in Memphis. And a fellow out of Arkansas wrote a book. 88 reasons the rapture is going to happen in 1988. All right, I'm not the only guy in the room who remembers this. And I don't know because my porthole on the world at that time was Memphis, Mississippi, Arkansas, sort of that Mid-South, Mississippi River Valley. In that part of the country, the book created quite a stir. He had the, he had the alarmism at a pretty good fever pitch. You saw a lot of copies of that book laying around. You saw a lot of super, you know, agitation. And his book had all kinds of pseudo-scriptural and wacky, quasi, it just, anyway. He had his scriptural proofs and his, you know, 19 diagrams of Old Testament festivals and all that sort of stuff going on. His ministry address, you know, because you're, in light of this, send me money. His ministry address was in the back of the book, so I wrote him a letter. I said, buddy, um, you obviously are convicted that you're out of here in 1988. And in order to get your message out in this last few minutes of history that we have, you are urgently in need of funding. I think I have a win-win for you. I will send you $10,000, probably all the money I had in 1988, if I even had it then. I will send you $10,000 and all I want in return is the deed to your house dated January 1, 1989. <laughs> You're not going to be here. What do you care who moves into your then abandoned house? If I'm with you and I go, well then, joke's on me. I, well, but it was $10,000. I wasn't going to have time to spend anyway. There seems to be no lose. This is win, win, win all the way around. You get the money now to urgently get your message out. And, and, and 
All I get in your scenario is your empty house to move into on January 1st, 1989. More likely sell it because I won't be moving anywhere. You know, he didn't take me up on it. <laughs> Why did he not take me up on it? Come on, you know the answer to this. Why did he not take me up on it? Because he had not bought what he was selling. Mm -hmm. He was a huckster. He was a huckster. Where you have prophetic alarmism, and I don't mean passion for the things of God. I don't mean desire to know all that the Lord has told us about what to expect. Prophetic passion is not a problem. But prophetic passion typically does not travel with prophetic alarmism. Prophetic hucksterism typically travels with prophetic alarmism. So when someone is breathlessly alarmed about prophetic events, I'm not talking about a gospel appeal. I'm not talking about, you know, help you with an urgent God. You could die tonight. You better come to Jesus. That was true last night, the night before, the night before that, and the night before that, the night before that. It's always our message. Come to Jesus urgently. Just don't bandwagon prophetic alarmism. Okay? Paul said, don't be alarmed. Jesus said, don't be alarmed. Brother Russell, it's bad over there. Horrible things are happening. I know. I've seen the same things you've seen. Breaks my heart. Stirs my emotions. Drives me to pray for Israel. Makes me want to move into a bunker in Montana as though I could avoid it and hoard gold and ammunition. That's not what God has called me to do. I'll, I'll, I'll say this and then I'll move on to the actual Bible study for tonight. I've, uh, I have had the joy for most of the last 40 years to train and orient mission teams to go to interesting places and do interesting things. And God has been so, 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 so very kind to me to allow me to take I bet by now, it, I don't know that it's a thousand people, but it wouldn't surprise me if it is. It's hundreds anyway. Some small teams, some quite large. Early on, when I used to do team meetings, <laughs> early on, I used to end the meeting by saying, are there any questions? Here's what I learned. I learned that there are always an inexhaustible supply of questions, and about 95% of them I can't answer. What are we going to be eating for lunch a week from Thursday? Yeah. <laughs> so a few years in, I started, I started asking something else. Instead of asking, are there any questions? What I ask today is this. Do you know what you need to know to do what you need to do? That's way better than are there any questions. When I look into Bible prophecy, I no longer ask, are there any questions? I've got a bazillion questions. I find it far more useful. Lord, show me what I need to know to do what I need to do. And you know what? He has. He has. One more brief rabbit. I'm just rabbit chase within rabbit chase within rabbit chase. I had somebody get upset with me one time because they had about 100 questions about the future of the nation of Israel in prophecy. And they, knew already, they knew more than I knew before they started asking questions. And two or three questions in, I said, I don't know. I don't know about all those details of prophecy for Israel. And I smiled and I said, but I'm not Jewish. I don't need to know 
all of what God is going to do with Israel in the future to do what I need to do as an engrafted Gentile believer. I'm not saying that there's not stuff there worth knowing. There is. This person wanted to ask me about the relationship between various festivals, moon phases, and, uh, and I'm going, man, I'm way too Gentile to be into that. <laughs> and I'm not being dismissive. If you, have to under, if you have to be an Old Testament calendar scholar to understand what the New Testament is teaching about prophetic events, then a whole lot of the original recipients of the New Testament had no hope of understanding what God was saying. That doesn't seem to make sense. It's not real good hermeneutics. All right. Rabbit chase over. Psalm 128, a psalm of ascents. And by the way, whenever I open my mouth on prophecy, I always offend somebody. You put five Baptists in the room, you'll get seven different prophetic positions. We do love to quibble. Flippancy aside, if I've done you any offense, come to me and allow me the privilege of apologizing to you. I do not mean to, I don't, sometimes I inevitably offend, but when I casually offend, I like the opportunity to make it right because I don't mean to do that. Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Oh, that has happened to me so often, my sister. We're all with you. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. And may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. A little ironic that he ends with that benediction, right? Here we are. All right. This psalm I have entitled... Principles and parallels. There's something very easy to spot going on structurally in this psalm that I think will, will help us focus up on, on specifically the blessings this psalm is talking about. There are two sentences in the psalm that are written in the third person. If you're, if you're a grammarian. That is... Not talking about me, not talking about you. Just talking about a thing out there that is true. A, a third person principle. They parallel one another. The, the, the principles of the third person principles are articulated in verse 1 and verse 4. Verse 1, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord who walks in his ways. Verse 4, behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Those two parallel third person sentences are the anchor points for the psalm. So let's talk about them just a little bit. I'm, there I am. Okay. Ask you a question. Who is it that will be blessed? Just look at the very first line of Psalm 128. Who is going to be blessed? Everyone, Everyone read on. Everyone who? Fears the Lord. All right, who fears the Lord? Um, there are two different words for blessed that weave through this psalm, almost used interchangeably. And the words are almost synonyms. There's a little bit of a nuance. And in, in Hebrew poetry, which is what the Psalms are. They're, they're hymn lyrics, which means they're poetry. When, they're, um, when, when near synonyms are used, what the author is doing is shading. He's, he's inviting you to consider. It's, it's like if I, had a, if I had a thing here that I wanted to show off, a little object, like in a display case. Rather than just putting one pin light on it from this direction, I might also put a pin light on it from this direction. Just so the shading and nuance and shapes and shadows come out with multiple. When you have in the Psalms, 
two words that mean about the same thing, but not quite, both shining on the same subject matter. There's a, there's a three dimensionality. There's shading and shadow that the author intends for you to grasp. The two words for, for blessing, one of them means fairly it's a simple word. One of them means just kind of happy, content. You know, I'm a blessed man, you know, uh, uh, don't have any roof leaks right now. Feeling pretty decent. Things kind of okay. I am, boy, I'm blessed. All right, that. That's the word that's used at the start of verse one. That there will be, there will be a, a contentment for the one who fears the Lord. Doesn't promise it as a constant state, promises it as an available state. Later through the psalm, the word blessed means specifically the recipient of God's favor. Receiving a blessing from the Lord. Now again, those two can be used kind of interchangeably because the reason I'm blessed is I've been blessed, right? One reason that I'm blessed is I've been blessed. You see, I'm using it in two different ways, even in that sentence. That's what this psalm is doing. All right. So... Who shall be blessed? Everyone who fears the Lord. Second question. Again, looking at verses one and four. Other than their blessedness, other than their fear of the Lord, what is, the, what is a defining characteristic of this man who will be blessed, who fears the Lord? What is another defining characteristic from those verses? Who walks in his ways. With an exclamation point. The one who fears the Lord and the one who walks in his ways, that's not two separate things. It's not two separate things. Jesus taught a similar truth in John chapter 10. And I, lo I love this passage because of all the, all the theology and practical living and encouragement John 10, 27. Jesus, in the great, it's, it's the great shepherd discourse is what the passage is often called. Starting in verse 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. Isn't that wonderful? My sheep hear my voice and I know them. It is a wonderful thing to be understood. <laughs> Dale and I will, um, will hit our 40th anniversary a week from Sunday on the 22nd, 40 years. She's the only person on earth who has had, my mom and dad got rid of me about the time I was 21 when I got married. My mom would tell you she never did figure me out. <laughs> and I love my mom and daddy. Mom, mom and dad are actually um, as you have heard me say on numerous times, still alive and flourishing at 89 and 92. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm about to turn 62 and I still have my daddy. I can call him tonight and ask his counsel, which blesses me enormously because he's wise. He's seen a lot. Gail, however, has spent 40 years in the valiant attempt to figure me out. <laughs> And she almost knows me. She certainly can predict me. She certainly guesses pretty accurately how I'm going to respond in any given situation, what I'm going to say at any given time. It is a joy to be well known to somebody. Jesus knows me. He knows my struggles. He knows my strengths. He knows me. Read on. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Because we have treated conversion so casually in North American church culture, we've had a whole bunch of people down the decades that we, we told them they were Christians because they 
walk through a shallow set of behavioral hoops. They said they, they, they repeated after us when we recited a prayer. And we, we dumbed down conversion to the point we had to create a whole category. I know that the New Testament speaks of carnality in the life of the Christian, but the New Testament does not know anything about a Christian that's not following Christ. We created this category of carnal Christian. That is someone who, who once did all the right hoop jumping, but since then has no evidence whatsoever of passion to follow Jesus. No evidence of an indwelling Holy Spirit, no love of God's people, no love of God's word, no love of the things of God at all. Well, they're just a carnal Christian. No, they're lost. They're lost. Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Here it comes, deep theology of the night. The followers of Christ follow Christ. Therefore, if you ain't following Christ, you're not a follower of Christ. A lot of repetitious words in there. They follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish. So from salvation to sanctification to glorification, all right there within just a dozen or so words. Back to Psalm 128, one. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, comma, who walks in his ways. That is not two separate steps. That's a description of the one who fears the Lord. The one who fears the Lord walks in his ways. Blessed. Verse four, behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. That's the principle. The grand, central, focal, nu nucleus truth of this psalm is that there is contentment and blessing to be found in following Jesus. Now with that principle, he draws three parallels. He shifts after verse one and after verse four, he shifts to the second person. He starts talking about you, specifically. Not, not you as a person specifically, but the grammar shifts to a second person reference to you. Verse one says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord who walks in his ways. And then he goes, you, Who's he talking to? He's talking to the person who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. But he shifts from third person to second person to make it more direct. There are three pairs. There are three in the wake of verse one and three more in the wake of verse four that, that pair up as parallels of the you, you, and you. Let's look at them. The first is his labor. The first parallel. Verse two you shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Verse 5, first part of the verse, the Lord bless you from Zion. This personal blessing, this personal blessing is tied to your engagement, to your labor. Verse two, it's a, it's a personal blessing tied to, to productivity and contentment. We're North American, it's you and I, and um, we tend to see things in terms of, well, I know what he's talking, he's talking about you'll, you'll have a job so you can pay your bills. Well, how very North American of you, and I'm all for having a job and paying your bills, but it's well more than that in view here. What he's saying is you will have just like with contentment, he's not saying you will always be content. He's saying you have access to contentment. And here he's saying you have access to a life with productivity and impact, a fruit-bearing life. Um, think of fruitfulness as the opposite of futility. Yeah, you, you, ha you have access to living your life in such a way that your life has a spiritually impactful blast radius, impact zone. 
you can bear fruit. You know, the fruit of the Spirit. Have you ever noticed that the fruit of the Spirit matter relationally? That the fruit of the Spirit only function in a relationship context. I'm, I'm, I am by natural just composition, I'm very much an introvert. And so if I have to spend six months on an island by myself, if I can have a way to keep my Kindle charged <laughs> and a supply of decent food, that doesn't scare me at all. Six months of isolation wouldn't frighten me one bit. I miss some people that I care about, but in terms of I would just be, I would just be, no, not, no. Peace and quiet and six months of good reading. Might be all right with that sometime. But I wouldn't need the fruit of the Spirit, would I? On my island by myself, love, joy, okay, maybe, maybe joy, Maybe peace, but peace is pretty relational. Love, joy, peace, patience. I only have to be patient because I'm living life with you. <laughs> and I'm worse. You have to be patient because I'm taking up some little piece of your life. Patience, kindness. Well, not if there's no one to be kind to. Goodness, not if there's not anyone to have moral interaction with. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. I don't need gentleness if I'm on the island by myself. I can be as rough as I want to be. Faithfulness means dependability in the context of, of Galatians 5. Well, if no one's counting on me, I don't have to be dependable. Self-control, oh, it's easy to be self-controlled when you're not having somebody else knock over your stuff all the time. Upset your apple cart. The fruitfulness that's promised here, yes, it certainly is akin to and a, a set beyond vocational fruitfulness is certainly a part of it. Do good work with good results. But it's life. It's much bigger. Okay? And that's the, the personal and, and productive character of, of, of that, that contentment, that blessedness that's promised in verse 1. And then verse 5a, the first part, tells you where all that comes from, where your capacity comes from. The Lord bless you from Zion. Now, he is using Zion and later um, Jerusalem and Israel in this psalm in a very literal sense in the setting of a psalm of ascent. If these are processional psalms and one is singing this in a group that is walking literally toward Jerusalem, then they're very literalistic in their original setting. But for me and you today, your provision and the Lord's blessing into your life is not coming from the Middle East. We care about Israel. We pray for Israel. But it is in an applicational sense for us, it is not the Lord bless you from latitude, longitude, coordinates that cross on the Temple Mount. It is the Lord bless you from his presence. And as New Testament believers, we know more about that than even our many times great-grandparents did. We have the presence and person. We have the living God dwelling among us and within us, who is the source of our blessing from Zion. So that first parallel is the, is the blessing that comes from productivity in life and contentment from our labor. The second parallel has to do with our love. It's in verses, the first part of verse 3 and the back part of verse 5. You can see these, by the way, by looking in your Bible at the you, 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 your, your, your. You can see them. The, the, his love. Um, verse 3, first part of the verse. 
Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Parallel with the back part of verse 5, may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. In both of these cases, it is may your love result in a fertile environment, a prosperous and blessed environment. In verse 3, first part, in the home. A well-cultivated life at home. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Marriage is meant to enhance and cultivate your walk with God. Your marriage is meant to be a very three-dimensional gospel tract to a watching world. And I know that it's hard. Gail knows that it's harder. <laughs> We're in a fallen world and nothing is ideal but Jesus. But that marvelous chapter on marriage, Ephesians 5, Remember, even in the midst of describing the love of the husband for the wife and the wife for the husband, Paul says, I tell you a mystery. I'm, this whole time I'm talking about Christ and the church. This whole conversation I'm having about how the husband and wife are to love each other, surprise, I'm talking about the gospel. Doesn't mean that he's not talking about the husband and wife. It means, well, what's he talking about, Russell? Is he talking about uh, earthly marital relations? Or is he talking relationships? Or is he talking about the, the gospel? Yes. Yes. Your marriage, sir, sir, your displayed and demonstrated love for your wife is to be something that illustrates readily what it looks like the way Jesus loves his people. Your committed, sacrificial, gallant love for your wife is supposed to be a working illustration of how the Lord loves his people. Ma'am, your holy, H-O-L-Y, submitted Leaning into your husband is supposed to be a picture of how the Lord's people can trust him. Whew, I ain't married to Jesus. I know you're not. I know you're not. I know you're not. But you're to be modeling something. And marriage is one of the many ways the Lord is making us like Jesus. Marriage is supposed to be sanctifying. I promise you, and I, we joke about marriage a lot, we have a lot of fun with the topic, and that's okay. My walk with God is way qualitatively more intense and intimate because of 40 years of marriage. There's no question. There is no question. I believe Gail would say the same thing. Fruitful. Impactful. And then the parallel, the second you in the, in the second part of the psalm, may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. This is the well-being of God's people. Yes, as we walk toward Jerusalem 3,000 years ago, we're talking about the center population of God's people around us 3,000 years ago, Jerusalem. For you and I today, okay, I get it, Lord. You're, you, want, you want my life to be a blessing to a Middle Eastern city in a high mountain valley Again, we're going to pray for Jerusalem. We're told to, Psalm 122, 6. But here, the application is the gathering of God's people. By the way, just as a footnote, 
I do not hold to replacement theology. And if that's what you think you hear me doing, you're not hearing me right. And if you don't know what replacement theology is, don't worry about it. That was a footnote. Set it aside. <laughs> the gathering of God's people is to be blessed because you love Jesus. 3A, micro scale, your family is to be blessed and fertile because you love Jesus. Verse 5b, more macro scale. The community of God's people is supposed to be more blessed and prosperous because you know Jesus. Okay? Again, it's another parallel. The parallel of our labor, here the parallel of our love. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. You know, this so much dovetails into what the New Testament teaches about spiritual gifting and our, our engagement in the body of Christ where God has planted us, the people of God that we are doing life with. It's a, it's a marvelous thing. As the Lord builds his church, he builds it with people with different strengths and different gifts and different capacities and different roles. And it is, it is a fun thing to watch. Um, we, we, we all have a role to play. What a, what a marvelous thing to contemplate. Why is my church better off with me here than they would be without me here? Ought to be a question you can answer. In what way is God using me inside my body of Christ? That has a lot to do with how your spiritual gifts should be playing out. Second parallel, your love. Third parallel, your legacy. Again, the central thesis of the psalm is the ones who fear the Lord, that is, the ones who walk in His way, will be blessed. Will have at least access to a contentment. Access to the benefits of the favor of God. Verse 3b, your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Is he promising that you'll have children? No. I, lo I love y'all's transparency to ask for the prayer you ask. And as God prepares your heart, and if it becomes the true desire and longing of your heart, to raise kiddos together, I bet two things. First, I bet you'll be really, really good at it. And I, uh, well, the other one's not a bet, it's a hope. I hope I get to meet the baby. I met, I met Ivy tonight back there. It's a neat thing to see God's people um, bringing children into godly homes. That fixes a lot when God's people bring children into godly homes. Hmm. But your children being like olive shoots. I confess to you, I had to do some digging because I don't know anything about olive plants. I thought this was talking about fruitfulness. When I first scanned this psalm in preparation to teach tonight, I thought, yeah, olive shoots. That's probably the end of the branch where the olive grows. He's probably talking about fruitfulness. Not mostly. I didn't know anything about olive trees. I did some reading the last couple of days. The olive shoot is not the end of the branch where the olive grows. I would have been mistaken had I not done some reading. There have been numerous instances where wildfires or other natural disasters have wiped out olive groves. Everything above ground you can see. This is what I did not know. The underground part 
of an olive tree plant even grove as the roots intertwine. The underground part is spectacularly resilient. If you have an olive grove and the whole thing gets burned down, everything you can see is reduced to ash. If you will then clear away the ash and the debris, that same root system will begin to send up new olive plants. Those are the shoots. An olive shoot is new growth coming right off the root, usually in response to some trauma. So this is not talking about fruitfulness as much as it is talking about resiliency. Resiliency. Probably talking about outlasting. What do I mean by outlasting? Well, if the actuaries are right, and the law of averages holds, and some of, some of you have attended the funeral of your children. In a room this size, this many people, I'm talking, to, I'm talking to somebody or bodies tonight that you have attended the funeral of your child. So again, we're not talking about lockstep biblical promise here, but generally. Generally, for many or most of us, our children will outlive us. It's very reasonable. My, daddy's, my daddy just broke 90 two years back. He was born in 31. I was born in 61. He's 30 years older than I am. If I make it into my 90s, which that's 30 years from now, if I make it to 2061, or 2051, in 2051, I'll turn 90. It's more likely, statistically, that in 2051... Philip and Kyle, my two sons, will be out there living for Jesus. It's quite likely that by 2051, and if you're over 90, God bless you. So is my dad and I love him and you keep on trucking until God calls you home. But it's not, at some point when they do the funeral, they stop saying you died too young. How old do you have to be before that? He's just gone so soon. I know they say that if you have your funeral when you're 20, they stop saying it at some point, right? You reach the point where they're no, gonna, no longer going to talk about your premature demise at your funeral. They're going to talk about how long you made it, right? My children are going to outlast me. Statistically speaking, in all likelihood, my children are going to outlast me. That's what he means by the shoots. The old, the old stuff that's been above ground for a while might just get burned off and be gone. But there will be new shoots coming up. That's how he wants you to see your children. That, that legacy of faithfulness that outlasts you, at least potentially. And then verse six speaks of generations of faithfulness. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. That's not a random benediction. Stuck. That peace be upon Israel is not just a random bumper sticker benediction stuck on here. It's a continuation of the thought of verse 6. My legacy, my, my, my children coming up like olive shoots when the olive tree itself may have aged out, but here come, or been destroyed, here come the olive shoots. And then, verse 6, in parallel, may you see your grandchildren and peace among Israel. That is, if you'll allow me to paraphrase, May you see a multi-generational impact on God's people as your faithfulness echoes down generations. Prodigality happens. I get that. Sometimes our children, even our grandchildren, are not what we hoped and prayed for. But especially, especially, and I'm new at grandparenting compared to some of you, 
But especially since becoming a grandparent, approaching now four years ago, I, I'm hearing more of you are sharing grandparents' stories with me, or else, at least, or, or else my radar is better at hearing them. And I got, I got a lot of friends in this church, a lot of us in this body of Christ. Some of you in this room, you've got stories right now of the blessing of godly grandchildren. Some of you have godly grandchildren that have made it to adulthood. And again, some of you also have struggles with prodigality and other passages speak to that. But the joy of, of contemplating Steve, I know something about your kids and I think I know something about your grandkids. It ain't half bad to have grandkids learning to walk with God, is it? It ain't half bad. Levi will turn four on November 4th. He does go to a fine little Christian preschool and I'm told that he does pretty well. I can't speak to his godly blast radius yet. The little booger's four. <laughs> he does seem to be sweet to his little 18-month-old sister most of the time. What a joy to think. When my grandfather Stedman was, I don't remember how old he was, it was 1957. He lived until 1984. But in 1957, my grandfather Stedman, my mother's father, my mom's an only child, my grandfather Stedman was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer in 1957 and wore a full colostomy from the late 50s for the rest of his life. They had to take out a whole bunch of stuff in the 50s. Cancer treatments were not subtle. When my big brother was born, when Van was born in October of 59, I wasn't around yet, but my parents tell me that my, my granddaddy said to them, they had just been married since 55. They were still young. But my, my Papa Stedman said to Mom and Dad, I don't suppose I'll ever see him grow up. Because he didn't think he was going to. He lived an enormously long time with his cancer diagnosis. Not only did he see Van grow up, he was at my wedding a year before he passed away. He was in, he was in uh, chemo at the time. He had... He had hair all the way through until chemo took it out the year before he died. This is mine. Thank you, Grandfather Stedman. The beard's gray, but I can shave that off. I can hide that. A lot of gray in this part, too, if I get in the right light, but it's hanging in there with me, so thanks, Pop. He saw godly grandkids. This side of heaven. And he was a, boy, he was a Jesus-loving man. That's what this is talking about. Does, it, does your walk with God guarantee that you'll have godly children and godly grandchildren? It does not. And some of you are living that tragedy, and I would never make light of that or stomp around on it. But it opens up an avenue of blessing to see godly children and godly grandchildren. And if you are struggling with prodigality, you must not despair. You must continue to pray and continue to trust. And if I had another hour and I don't, if you are dealing with a prodigal child or grandchild, you must, 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 if you haven't read it recently, you must read Ezekiel chapter 18 before you sleep tonight. Ezekiel 18, tucked away in Ezekiel, is a marvelous chapter for those who are struggling with, specifically struggling with a prodigal child and they're wondering what they could have done differently. That's free. That's, a, that's another, another footnote. And if I had another hour, we'd go there and I'd walk you through it. 
it's not complex. You can read it and be blessed by it, I think. So, blessed is the one who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. Psalm of Ascent. Thank you.